the big because I um yeah woo cool hi everyone welcome to Maud's book club we are a sci-fi and fantasy online book club that's on discord that's on social medias that's doing a couple of books every single month and has been for the last couple of years um what's been really exciting with this particular book club is that we love dungeon crawler carl around here i was introduced to the series about two years ago and just hit the ground running and with this community, we have been up to book five reading the series together. So all of September, we broke down The Butcher's Masquerade. It was so much fun. You might remember that around this time last year, we just covered books one and two. And to celebrate that, we got Matt Dinneman on the show to talk all about Dungeon Crawler Carl. And then a couple of months later, we got Jeff Hayes on the show who did some of the best renditions of God Damn It Donut that you can find on YouTube if you want to see that compilation. Uh, but I figured since there's a, a big announcement that Matt needs to make, I figured we'd get Matt back on the show. There you are, Matt. How are things? How's life? You seem so busy lately. Hi, Maude. Thank you so much for having me. I am busy. I've been doing, it seems like, spinning 50 plates at once. I am. Just finishing up book seven. I am working on a, another complete novel that needs to be done by January. What? I am going. Well, that's that's not really news. Uh, Ace purchased the rights to a standalone novel called um, Operation Bounce House, and I'm turning that in in January. Uh, it's another book. Uh, we can talk about that if you want to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sci-fi novel about farmers being evicted from their planet uh by earth forces and the earth mercenaries that are they're doing it they gamify the eviction process by charging gamers on earth for the right to design their own war machines and pilot them remotely and I watched hundreds of hours of counter strike videos little kids being little shits on on video to, i feel like everyone's you know, got a counter strike story i've got a counter strike story uh, mine involves getting dumped because I pretended I didn't know how to play Counter Strike and humiliated <laughs> him in front of all of his all of his friends in the eleventh grade. <laughs> it's amazing. By but the way, Chris. All... <laughs> Sorry, got out of my system. Oh, uh, doing lots of cons. Um, I have a nice, smooth few weeks free now um, with just a few book signings here and there um, because. Uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl's now been trad published. Books yeah. one and two are out. Book three is coming out the 22nd. I believe they're behind Books you if you want to show us a few. Oh, yeah, I do have oh. some. Um, Would you look at that? Just conveniently right here. Just by coincidence. Uh, so book one uh, is now out. You can get it in any Target for the month of October. Woo! Any Walmart, uh, any bookstore, um, Hudson sellers in the airport. I just... Signed some yesterday. Did at you do sneaky Airport. signings? Oh, your camera I, is I, not I, focusing on you right now. There we go. You're competing with your own book here. <laughs> I, I've done um a few sneaky signings. I um my wife and I we went into Walmart the other day in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and they had book one and book two on the shelf, and I pulled a sharpie out of my pocket and I, I signed them and. <laughs> We were walking out um, out of the store, and two uh, sheriff's deputies were sitting there waiting for us. <gasps> and and the manager came out and was like, "You are vandalizing books." <laughs> and you're like, "No, no, author, I write my name. I'm I'm enhancing value." Yes, and um, I explained to them who I was, and the poor manager it kind of like short cir short circuited her brain. She didn't know what to do. The um, the sheriff's deputies thought it was hilarious, and one of them said he was going to go in and buy one. I don't know if he did or not, but it worked out. Okay, um, good. I didn't get arrested, which is good. What do you and, uh, sign in your books? When you I usually it? sign uh, my name and glurp blurp, or yep. I'll sign something like a uh, secret Walmart book signing, and then I'll put the date okay. and stuff like that. Um, and then I'll tweet about it usually, uh, and then people will, can go and find them. And it's like a global sending pictures. That's really neat. Oh, that's fun. Like a scavenger hunt almost. That's really cool. Yeah. I've seen uh, videos of Brandon Sanderson doing the same thing, but he mm -hmm. will sign Patrick Rothfuss's books. <laughs> <laughs> Just trolling everyone. Which is pretty funny. You want to hope the inside joke works. Uh, I do want to recognize <laughs> the chat. Uh, it's going off at the moment. Uh, Fail Tasmogoria 
uh, first commenter saying glurp glurp. So obviously read the memo, totally understanding it. Uh, tell me what I missed and thanks for the inspiration. Uh, also kill, kill, kill. God damn it, Donut getting a mention in here as well. Loving all of this. Thanks for everyone to, uh, for showing up. Uh, if you haven't already jumped by the Discord, there's a button you can click. Do that one. I uh, would love to have you over here because we're going to continue reading these series here. KP Dubs, thank you so much for gifting some subs as well right now. Thanks for all the followers as well. Jay Buntrock, gifting some uh, five subs as well. There is a hype train. Uh, choo-choo. Motherfuckers, choo-choo. All right, so uh, what we do, which is quite unusual here, which I am a big fan of, of Maud's Book Club, uh, in my day job, I'm an entertainment reporter and I've been interviewing celebrities for 15 years. I know the math doesn't math, but I have been. And what I love to do is combine interviewing people with books. And I also like to give you guys access. So on the Patreon, uh, there is a Google document. It is a paid perk. You can write your favorite author, whatever question you want, and I will answer, I will ask them on your behalf. And we've got a few in here, Matt, if you're ready to power through some questions. I believe you've heard it all. So we hopefully won't have any shocks here. Uh, But we're going to start out. Vaden has uh, done a few questions and I find this to be really interesting. Is Carl on the aero ace spectrum, meaning aromantic or asexual, or does he just avoid those types of relationships in the dungeon especially given the way that the crawl uses loved ones against each crawler. I do want to preface by saying in our last discussion, um, I did talk about the fact that there is no romance with the main character, but there are starting to be blossoming romances, spoiler, um, happening in the dungeon, which seems likely if you're surrounded by people day in, day out, um, and you want that connection. But is Carl on an aromantic or um, asexual spectrum? And uh, I wouldn't, I would say he's not, he's, you know, he starts off as just a regular dude that just wants to get from point A to point B. He is not super motivated by, you know, sex and love. Like some people are, but he is so overwhelmed right now with everything that's happening. The idea of romance just hasn't even pinged in his mind and if you watch subtly there's some people around him who kind of hint at it every once in a while and it just like the idea of it is just completely foreign to him and i don't necessarily see that changing anytime soon as long as you know everyone around him is fighting for their lives i was gonna say like there's just not enough um time out there in a survival mode of literally fighting for your life Uh, Some people have found that, which is amazing. But timeline-wise, Carl is still hurting from his ex-girlfriend cheating on him. Like, they were together for years. They lived together. That's still sort of a wound that he hasn't even really been allowed to address. Right. And and it's hard to tell because of the scope of the books, but the first book started, you know, the first couple days of January, and we are in March at this point. It's only been a couple months, and... It's just constant, constant, constant fighting. Don't worry, they can just sleep for two minutes and it's fine. So they can utilize all that other. When you took sleep away from him, I felt that. (laughs) Like he's getting a full night rest in a few minutes, but like, I don't know, an hour or too fast. There's no sense of like unwinding and switching off. Um, No, it's one of the most horrific things they've done to them, I think, um, honestly. But it makes sense. Time is so precious. You could be using that time to skill up, to level up. Hmm. Um, Much of the storylines are centered, oops, sorry, are centered around the use of powerful magic items, including the Ring of Divine Suffering and the Anarchist's Cookbook. What is your process for designing such interesting and consequential items? I love the idea of just bringing little things into the story that change everything. I mentioned this before, the Anarchist Cookbook was actually voted on by the fans, but I never really specifically said what it's going to do, and I kind of just made it up when I put it there. And for The Ring of Divine Suffering, I had invented it as kind of a method to to understand why um, Maggie had done what she had done way back in book one um, with her daughter. And... The existence of the ring makes sense to me. It, the implica- implications of what it can do 
have far reaching, you know, reverberations throughout the entire story. It's yeah. in traditional crawls, it has a big impact on the ninth floor, which is the next book that's going to come out. And we'll see if and how it has any implications in book seven. But I, I enjoy that sort of like everything can change at any moment. And when you tie it to specific little items or a specific spell that can have a huge impact, it, it just makes the writing process so much more fun. I like to have this whole toolbox just sitting by my side of all these different things I can play with. How many are in the toolbox now, though? That toolbox is just bursting. It, it, it's a little long. <laughs> there are so many things in there that um, I was just sifting through it the other day because I keep track of everything. Yeah. We have lottery scratch-off tickets that Donuts never used. We have um, all sorts of little things. We have that little stuffed animal, the Kamaris figurine that we haven't used yet. We have Carl's Doomsday Scenario, the oh. entire... The, the bomb from book two. He 0. Used... 0. 0.02. He's going to pull that out. It's gone. There's no, not even time to place or set this bomb. Right. Yeah. There are so many little things. And we just added a couple more in book seven. And there's some in book six, too. Like, they bring a card from the previous floor. Everyone gets to bring one card. So we don't know who what the card everyone has yet until they have to use it. And a lot of that's just fun to play with. And sometimes I don't have... I don't know what they've brought until it becomes important and then I pull it out of the toolbox. Are there times and situations where your, let's say Carl has that ring where he can swim underwater and it's like there's an mm -hmm. underwater moment and you're like, oh, that's right, that's not going to be dangerous anymore because I've got something that's going to sort that out. And like he almost becomes invincible because there's so many items that can counteract any dangerous situation. It happens all the time. Okay. Um, it's one of the most dangerous things about writing this style of book and they call there's even a word for it it's power creep uh they get so strong that nothing seems challenging anymore and as a writer that's that's the balance you you don't want to like be a complete jerk and keep smashing them down and not having any wins but at the same time you can't make them too powerful that the story doesn't exist anymore there's no more conflict because they can just stroll their way through any any issue well, at the end of the day, we've only got 10 fingers, you know, two anklets um, and two nipples. So mm -hmm. unless you're donut. So there is like, you know, you have to pick and choose what you're going to place armor wise. Uh, I do want to reference a comment that Bartleby Prime made a little bit earlier when we're talking about Carl not pursuing anyone in the dungeon. He said, you have to have a lot of confidence to court someone pantless. <laughs> Dude still doesn't have shoes. Definitely doesn't have pants. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a hard one to go by. Um, the next question that we have, there are many characters who become self-aware um, as well as sapient, like a number of the AIs, NPCs, and earth animals um, that ate the enhanced pet biscuits. Do you view the way that they've handled it as how it would go in our world, if that's ever even possible? Or does the crawl affect them differently? It definitely affects them differently. We have we only really know about two or well, three that have eaten the pet biscuits and are still in the dungeon. We have Donut, we have Prepotente, and we have Bianca, who's the, the goat dragon thing. Um, all three of them affected in a different way. Prepotente is now bipedal and has hands, whereas Donut's still a cat. They're both intelligent, but Prepotente has a different type of intelligence that hasn't fully been revealed yet. And then Bianca gets turned into like a dragon thing. And then we also hear about a few other goats that ate the pet biscuits and they went crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's so many different, who knows what would happen in real life. It depends on the experiences they had. For Donut, for example, she sat in her cat tree and was watched television her entire life pretty much while no one was home and the pet biscuit gave her the ability to remember pretty much everything that she had seen and then kind of formed this narrative of who she was and since she remembers it all prepotente a uh, small spoiler has like the knowledge of a bunch of encyclopedias in his head but doesn't really has no social skills whatsoever, really, and is still super immature. I'm, I'm going to throw in mummy issues. Um, yeah, yeah, just a just a little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, and he's a good goat. He's a good goat. So it, it's fun to play with. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I like to think about what would my dogs or my turtle do if they ate the 
Oh, we've this had that discussion. Of, it was like a full 40-minute yeah. discussion on the book club with my dog Zelda, who's just reclining very peacefully <laughs> right there beside us. Uh, existential crisis just unraveled completely. How would your yeah. dog go or turtle? Well, I have, well, I have multiple dogs, but um, it depends on which one. Like I have a little Maltese named Chanel. She's an 11-year-old Maltese, and she would just think that she's – you know, a mountain lion and would tear through the dungeon, attacking everything and get us killed immediately. Whereas my dog, Freddy, um, Labrador, he would just want to love everyone, get us killed immediately. I think most of my pets would get us killed, except maybe Tina, who's a turtle. And <laughs> Go, Tina. Yeah. I love that. Well, I'm glad you thought about it as well. Um, Jay Buntrock, no question, but just says, I can't think of any questions. I just want to say I have no complaints. Thank you for such an amazing book. Or oh, amazing books, plural. So that's oh, I have no complaints about you either. There you go. Um, KP Doves says, from the very beginning, we learn about floors 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18 being part of a larger story. Did you have that story planned out from the beginning? Or are you just making it up as you go? Do you know what's happening on the 12th or the 18th floor right now? I am pretty much making it up as I go along. I do know a little bit about the 12th floor. I know a little bit about the 15th floor and I know a little bit about the 18th floor, but it's not completely fully fleshed out in my brain. It's, you know, what's happening in the dungeon is a parallel to the history of what happened on the outside of the dungeon. And I think that's been kind of pointed out and it's a little clear, uh, but not really. And I've said it before, I'm a pantser. I make these stories up as I go along, but I keep very careful track of everything that's behind me. Also, and sometimes I'll come. Just to play on that pun, you're a pantser but won't give Carl pants? Interesting, interesting, sorry. <laughs> so you'll play into this, you'll plan ahead slightly. Yeah, and sometimes if I come up with something off the cuff of my pants or off the whatever, and then I, I came up with it when I was writing book three and then I'll just save it for later and then have it come out later you know when i'm writing book seven or book eight and sometimes i'll change it and sometimes i'll throw it away if i need to but i have lots of little plans on things but nothing's set in stone until they're you know printed in the printed in the book and it could stay a good idea but then not kind of follow with where the story turns yeah that happens all the time i bet uh steph says so hold on does that mean that carl makes it to the 18th floor Oh, we don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Okay. All right. Next question. I love how there are no throwaway lines uh, or names in this series. Things tend to come back around. For example, Portus who? Portus? Portus. 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 Portus who? Mentioned as the second edition uh, cookbook crawler, then as a sponsor. The TV series Doctor Who does this often as well. Are you a fan of Doctor Who? And was it an influence for Doctor Who? Dr. Hugh, and I am not a fan of Dr. Who because I have never watched a single episode of that show. What? I know. Um, you know, I introduced you know, the, the the 13th Doctor on television with, with Miss Jodie wow, Whittaker. That's, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I just show. haven't had time. It's on my list. Um, oh, if my, you don't have time, don't, don't go near that. <laughs> it's, it go, it's, see, it's seasons, and there's also two generations where there's like right. times, decades, 50, I, 50 I'm aware. Um, yeah. My son was a big fan of it, and my wife, when she was growing up in England, she watched like the old ones a long time ago, and I, but I just never had a chance to, to see it. It's Again, it's on my list. Like one day I'll start watching it, but there's just so much to do. Mm, right, retire. Doctor Who, love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you co- That's the plan. You're coinciding writing two books currently? You're concurrently writing two books? Sort of. Um, I'm 100% focused on the ending of book seven right now. I'm about halfway done with the other book. And basically, as soon as I'm done with seven, while I'm editing book seven, I'm going to be full steam ahead into finishing Operation Bounce House. That's a, it's not a lit RPG, really, so it, it, it's so much easier to write. It sounds like a vacation to me, honestly. No standalone book, no pages and pages of Excel sheets to go back over to figure out who said what, who has what in their inventory. It's just a straight a story. Whole story, beginning, middle, and yeah. end. 
What a luxury. And I, yeah, and as soon as I'm done with seven, I'm going to go straight into book eight, too. So there's not any real, any real slowdown. There, there are, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the Dominion of Blades and the Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon big fans. Have you mm -hmm. neglected your children? Will you be coming back to them? <laughs> so Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon is one and done. It's in the Dominion of Blades universe. It happens before the action of Dominion of Blades. What happens at the end of Kaiju gets revealed in Dominion of Blades 3, which I will finish. That's... So just back off, it'll happen. It's going to happen. You know, I honestly, I would have done it, finished it a long time ago. Dungeon Crawler Crawl hadn't really taken off like it had. It, it, and you took off. You, uh, I, I will get into all of these because the success of what the last sort of even months have shown us is just amazing. Um, I'm going to throw it to the chat if there's any kind of other last minute questions that have been itching my brain as well. Um, I will come forward with those. But the last question from KP Dubs, this was a, a little tidbit that happened in the first book that he got really latched onto that I didn't really know much about. But have you ever visited the USS Constitution or any other museum ships? I ha well, I live in, so where I live, I live in Gig Harbor, Washington, and near me is Bremerton, which has some, it used to, it has some aircraft carriers there you can visit. I visited a few um, ships in Virginia Beach as well, including, I can't remember if I've actually visited the Constitution or not, if it's possible. There's a ship and a couple of ships in Virginia Beach, but I visited several, and I like ships. I like submarines. I like old boats um just so many little things they learn about along the way and they write books about them like trains i love trains as some people may know and hate but um <laughs> you did a whole book on them i believe <laughs> yeah i love cats what and do you dogs. know well yeah. do you because there is a question that's coming in hot here uh let me try and find it the chat is blasting off at the moment but basically saying what is your issue with um, Cocker Spaniels. <laughs> I think Cocker Spaniels are fantastic. Okay. Uh, Donut doesn't like, doesn't, Donut doesn't like Cocker Spaniels. I've met a few groomers who don't like Cocker Spaniels. <laughs> All right, they're so cute. Yeah. They are. Um, but not co Ooh, Cocker Spaniels. Yeah, here we go. Let's stay on track here. Here we go. We're trying to get there. Um, oh, everyone's just basically saying that they got to meet you and how wonderful you were. Do you remember me? Uh, that one was from Ian uh, T. Lock, who said that one. Um, there was uh, another question in here. Sorry if I didn't say who was uh, saying this one, but this is an interesting one. Does Mordecai know that he was played by Carl by being included to be a manager? That So that question, Mordecai, at the end of book one and the beginning of book two, Odette says to them, don't tell Mordecai that I'm the one who talked you into it uh, because he'll get mad. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a question is why is he mad? Because it seems like that's a better gig than what he was doing. And he gave kind of an offhand answer and we haven't gotten the answer to that question yet. And that will come up eventually. Uh, we Does Mordecai know? I imagine he suspects. I imagine he doesn't know outright. I imagine that may or may not eventually get addressed directly before we're done. Well, you do see more and more him feeling kind of neglected or um, mm -hmm. like they're not, they're not taking his advice uh, as gospel. Like there was a time in especially books one to four um, where they just knowledge is power, knowledge is surviving, and he's an mm -hmm. encyclopedia of like everything that you should do. Here's how you should spend your stat points. Here's why you should level up and what you should level up. This is why this ring is so good. Avoid these um side quests and focus on this like having that guide so important but now with the butcher's masquerade we're noticing more and more he's like well i think you should do that but you're not going to listen to me anyway and he's almost building up this resentment and disgruntlement of the fact that they've outgrown their own manager who's been doing this for decades possibly centuries so i think that right. that's a yeah. really interesting dynamic yeah and that's like what happens in real life with people and children as they grow up they're when they're in their teen years, they stop listening to their parents. And sometimes, you know, their problems become more complicated. They're suddenly in territory that their parents don't know. I'm, But they still have advice. And 
we see that mirrored in multiple ways um, with Donut with Carl, Carl with Mordecai, Donut and Carl with Mordecai. And then the dungeon as a whole, the admins as a whole are now dealing with things that they've never had to deal with it either. And they're pretending to know what to do, but no one knows what's going on. And it seems possibly it's like a theme of the whole series in certain ways that we grow and we kind of stray from off the path and now we're meeting and seeing things that have never been seen before dealing with situations that we don't know what we're doing mm. and i enjoy playing with those sort of dynamics yeah because carl's doing things that us the audience don't even realize or even donut doesn't realize and he's just gone a bit batshit bonkers which is kind of my favorite carl um the foot guy ai is <laughs> their username <laughs> foot guy ai asks uh, what twist are you most proud of? So that's the person's name, Foot Guy AI. The Foot Guy <laughs> AI. Look what you've Alrighty. done. <laughs> <laughs> and you should see my inbox. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> there's so many twists I really like. I think one of the first ones that I came up with on the fly, I wasn't planning on doing it, was Ekla. Uh, mm. The scene with her and Katya on the and Eva on the train. Uh, I was just writing, and that's what that's what happened when I wrote that scene that I liked the best because I had in my head this whole Ekla story arc, and she becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Eventually, becomes the top crawler. I have all these ideas. Another one was the uh, floor seven. Uh, which we can't really talk about. Well, we I guess we can. Spoiler, but, if anyone hasn't read book, uh, book six. That's book five. That's book five? Or, no, that's book five. Um, it's, the, it's the epilogue of book five. Oh, then yes, we have covered that for our book club. If you have not yeah. personally, you have not done book five, tune out for the next 30 seconds. Well, I, I had this whole plan for what was going to happen, and then a patente just kind of, Threw it all out the window because I thought it would be funny. That was amazing, though. He, that was such a beautiful moment. And you also you got reminded why he was at the top spot for so long, why he's such a powerhouse. Like, he's brilliant. And I remember asking the community, I was like, I would love to see Prepotente's stat points because his intelligence just must be through the roof to be able to do that. Or he's being fed information. How's your poker face, Matt? <laughs> which one is it <laughs> oh we don't know we never said that the dungeon anarchist cookbook is the only thing like it in the dungeon have we no and he's got a very interesting fan base out there that you know i don't think mm -hmm. speak syndicate standard even so i don't i personally don't um understand ah! on a good day <laughs> so it's just, you know, who knows if there's subliminal messaging in there. Uh, I like that question, though. I've got one here from Billster with an E, uh, three instead of an E. It says, how soon book seven? And I thought that this was a great little segue because uh, we've been kind of hyping up this week that you have an announcement to make. What's the announcement? I do. Hmm. Uh, so if you go on Amazon right now as of a couple hours ago you will see the pre-order for book seven is up and it just popped up uh november 11th as in a month from today you will have the ebook of book seven there is no pre-order for the paperback but there will be a paperback version of it uh i will put the pre-order up for that as soon as i finish the wrap cover because apparently you have to have the full cover before you can put the pre-order up oh in addition, there will the Audible pre-order should be showing up in a few days as well, and that's for February. Uh, my friends over at Audible were working really hard to get the pre-order up in time for this particular interview. In their words, oh, I love Maud. I'd love to get the pre-order up. True. I didn't tell her that. Uh, but it's not up just yet, but that is coming out in February. So keep your eyes peeled. We've got it right here right now. November 11 is when you can get your greedy little pause on the next book. We do have a link. So if you type in exclamation mark DCC, a link will pop up with that pre-order link. So you can pre-order 
the ebook right now. In a couple of days, you'll be uh, get access to the audio book for that one. Cut to Jeff just in the studio sweating, <laughs> getting that one done. Um, and that audio book's going to be out in February. Uh, February, sorry, that word got a little bit hard for a second. So. Um, DCC to get the information for that one you can click through the link Um, I also want to congratulate you because you have had an amazing six months and I kind of want to talk about some of the things that you've gone through Um, last time we spoke was about a year ago and you just signed on with WME and that was a really cool deal Um, and every time I was like well are we going to see it in a movie TV show and you're kind of like oh I'll watch this space well, August, I believe, 21st, uh, it was announced that Universal International Studios uh, bought Dungeon Crawler Carl with Seth MacFarlane's Fuzzy, Fuzzy Door and Chris Yost attached. Now, Seth's production company is going to get him bought for this one, and he's very much known for comedy. And Chris Yost, very funny writer as well, done a lot of stuff with Marvel. My questions mm-hmm. are, what was the selling point for you? Is it... What was the most important thing, the standout for your baby to be treated the best? My, I only had one rule and that was, if the person who buys it, bought it, has to have one, read it and two, enjoyed it. Uh, And. Hold on. How many meetings did you take with people who hadn't read the freaking book? More than one or the, the people, or they they, they what they do is they look at how many books have sold, which is quite a few. We've sold across the series, across the mediums. We just did the numbers yesterday. We're at one and a half million copies. It's insane. Oh my uh, goodness! But a lot of people I've found they they see the enthusiasm, they see the numbers, and they don't care what the story is about. They just want to throw something up on the shelf because they know so so many people are going to buy it. And I'm, I'm really worried about that. You see that happen a lot with a lot of products that are beloved and then they end up getting adaptations that don't even, you know, they don't They weren't made with love. The, yeah, and you right. can tell. Chris Yost, specifically the writer, he was on my Patreon before any of this happened. He was a fan of the story before it was ever sold. Uh, and that alone made me very happy because he's very passionate about it. I've talked to him about it. He, he gets the story. The folks over at Fuzzy Door really, really enjoy it. The, um, Universal, Jordy, Jordan Moblo over at Universal, who he's also a book blogger, and he just interviewed me, but it hasn't come out yet. And he is a big fan of the story. He's gone over it with his own book club, and well, where can we find underst- out more about that? Where can people tune in to get that interview when it's out? It's a Jordy's book club. Is he's on Instagram mostly? It's J O R D Y apostrophe's book club. And I wish he- I called mine Morty's book club. It'd be Morty's and Jordy's book club. That's cute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So we interviewed last week, and he said it's going to come up sometime soon, but. It- I don't know when that's going to happen, but he's mentioned my book more than once on his book club. So it's pretty cool. But so everyone that's involved is not just read it and enjoyed it, but they understand the theme and the themes are, even though it's humorous, there's really a dark core to it. There's really what it's really about. It's about survival. And that's, that's what was super important to me. So, so far everyone we've met that's worked on it has really gotten it. And, Hopefully we can keep that momentum going. I love that. Uh, Jar the Bra says, are you, concern- Ooh, where are, we? are you concerned about the simplification of your story after optioning it? Part of the amazing part of the series is the level of nuance. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's always going to be a concern about anything that gets adapted from one medium to the next. And the truth is I've never done this before. I don't really know anything about Hollywood. And I don't know how it's going to turn out if and when it eventually does get adapted. We don't even know if it's going to be animated or live action at this point. Again, cut to <laughs> Jeff Hayes being like, animated, animate, animate, I got you. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I can't wait to find out. I am concerned about all sorts of things. This Again, this is new to me, but we'll see what happens. Just know that I will do my best to keep it with whatever voice I have in the process, whether it be small or big, I will do my best to keep the theme Mm. and the feel of Dungeon Crawler Carl 
you know, on the screen the best as possible. Have you received feedback on what the people would want more? We should do a poll in the chat right now. Would you rather see Dungeon Crawler Car live action or animated? Make your vote count. Kill, kill, vote, vote, vote. Um, so how much has your life changed since we last spoke? How much further has that gone along? You've been, you've got a publisher now. You've got hardback covers. This is so cool. Yeah, the whole world, it, my world has been turned upside down. I mean, when we talked last, I was doing this full time already. It, it was my job. It was feeding my children. It was making it so I could be a writer for a living, which that alone is pretty rare amongst people like my peers. And that's been amazing. But in the past year, like you said, we've had the, the publishing deal. They've purchased another book that we already talked about that's completely different than Dungeon Crawler Carl. Uh, all the TV stuff has come out. I've been guest of honor at conventions. I've gone to a lot of shows. And it's all amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's surreal to me. For someone who's been a little, ever since he was a little kid, he wanted to be a writer. And it's it's just wild. The demand that's happening as well, like the fact that you've got people saying, but the other series that you wrote, I want more of that. And you're like, I've got yeah. three books that I need out, at, you know, in a window. <laughs> We've just announced, if you're just tuning in, we have just announced the release date of book seven, which you can pre-order right now. Use exclamation mark DCC in the chat. A pre-order link will come up for you so you can order it right now. Have you finished the book? Is it locked? It's not locked. Yeah. I am. <laughs> Thank you for using this time I to am... chat with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> I I just gave my Patreons on my Patreon like chapter. I can't remember what it is. I can it look is. it up because I'm in it. Uh, I've got it but right it's in front of me. Uh, book like chapter seven. 73 and chapter 74, I think. It is. Um, and an audio audible version cover reveal if you're on the yeah. Patreon. So that, That's pretty close to the end i i'm actually further than what patreon has but i anticipate only a couple more drops before we get to the epilogue and the epilogue i haven't written yet it's which your epilogues are always the <laughs> your epilogues are always the gut punch back with slap like you, yeah everything's in I, those and I, I actually don't know what i'm gonna write for yet i have a couple ideas uh and it's gonna be Probably a little bit longer than normal, I think, if it goes in the direction I want. Um, well, book five's epilogue had an entire level in there, so. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're saying. We probably that, won't do that one. Well, you've got to get through these levels, you know. Yeah. Um, well, we were saying just before we started interviewing the length of book seven, and you said it's going to be a little bit more than Butcher's Masquerade, but a little bit less um, than the book six that's come out. Now, book six was that's right. a chonk. Book six was a chonk. Book five was a chonk. Yeah. Uh, I suspect, depending on how long the epilogue is, it's going to be shorter than book six. As always, it's longer than I anticipated. When I edit, the, edits, the books get longer instead of shorter. I don't know how that works out because... That's not the way it's supposed no, to go. There's too um, much to say. I get it. Yeah, I, I must resist the urge to explain. That's the little post that I have on the edge of my computer. But yeah, we'll see how it ends up. It's so the audiobook itself is going to be longer than the book one and probably just a little shorter. I mean, longer in book five, a little bit shorter in book six. But it's. It's settling into a range, so that's 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 good. Okay, so what we can expect just like mammoth storytelling and a lot happening. And I, the more characters yeah. we get, the more adventure we get, the more situations we get. Um, I'm putting the link interspersely uh, in the chat for your Patreon if people want to check out your work. Uh, if you do sign up, you get to read the first 74 chapters uh, before publishing, and there's an audiobook cover reveal as well, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I've been in a part of your patreon since our last uh interview which was great well, thank you for that you're very regular on it you're very good at it um because we have just covered butcher's Mas masquerade and we are flying through this interview i wanted to do some book five specific questions because we did just cover it for maud's book club um on behalf of my entire community and we are like 1600 strong in our discord what the fuck was with that ending <laughs> what specific part um 
I, let's start with Katya and what Eva did because she just I wasn't to planning have her- on writing that either. It just kind of came out, but you know, we needed, we needed a way to show <laughs> how Katya was kind of crumbling from the inside out. Yeah. And we needed more tension and we needed uh, what I'm doing, going to do at the end of book seven to happen. So uh, <laughs> did you write, have you written it? Are you tearing up? No, I up? haven't written it. No, I'm not tearing up. I'm trying to keep from laughing, but um, <laughs> I haven't. I haven't actually decided how it's going to go yet. That's that's the part I, I'm banging my head up against right now because it's something that's been built up for such a long time. But it all comes down at the end of book seven. Okay, and you haven't written it yet. I haven't written it yet. I'm going to write it the next two days. Oh. My God. Okay, the timing of this is quite amazing. So obviously Katya was an interesting story. You even said like um, the heckler was supposed to be the big, right. bad, strong person in contention. Uh, that entire fallout making Eva sort of the her nemesis, um, but Katya finding her identity and finding purpose and finding who she is. Um, but also, we discovered in the epilogue of Butcher's Masquerade that she's coping with things in a very different way as well. Um, you introduced um, the uh, there's substances in in the crawl, and a lot of the time it's like the NPCs that are just making time go a bit faster with that. But she's um, we're we're seeing the implications of fighting for your life day in day out for entertainment for months now. Um, and there's great conversations about Carl with this raging water that's happening as well. And we had great conversations in the book club about that, whether that was stemmed from things that happened in his past, or if it's the ring of divine suffering, or if it's the ring that's taking that trauma and ramping it up, because it's like, what suffering have you been running from? Uh, I'd love to get insights into sort of Carl and that raging water uh, we do find out a little bit more about it in book six, and I don't know how spoiler we want to get for the people in my book club that haven't read that yet, even though I have. Um, but how is it sort of providing so much dimension with these characters? Yeah, well, I mean, the question as to, like, dealing with mental health, that's yeah. always been an important issue for me. And so we do get in, we introduce kind of in book five the the idea that, what we see on the screen and what's going on inside is like completely different. And that's, you know, the ending with Katya is a great example of that because up until that moment, you didn't realize that how, how much she was hurting on the inside and book six, we deal with Katya without spoilers a little bit, but we also deal with Carl a lot more and book seven, we deal with Katya a lot more. Mm. So we see, Kind of like we learn a lot of Carl's backstory in book six. We learn a lot of Koch's backstory in book seven. And all of that helps shape how they react to the, all the things that are happening in the present of the story. And I, I like to have like a whole cast of characters and all of them are dealing with it in different ways because I think that's realistic. You take 20 people who've experienced extreme trauma and you're going to get 20 different reactions mm-hmm. to it. And there'll be some similarities, of course, but we all lash out or we, you know, turn into little balls of mush or we rise to the occasion. And nothing, sometimes we do all three of those things because humans aren't one emotion. We aren't one, one thing. And I love the idea of that dynamic in a story that's supposed to be, you know, a silly story about a talking cat. But it's also what it's really about is people and how people react to extreme circumstances and that's what i i it's what makes writing such a joy i also think it's been beautiful in this book as well that um donut is experiencing human emotions and is so confused about why why am i feeling this or why am i not feeling this particular emotion as well so having those real heart-to-heart conversations like the the praise that we have for these book series where it's so much fun and we do call it the palate cleanser because there's other books that we've read uh, over the years that are just destroying souls. Um, But there's so much joy and there's so much heart and there's just 
poignancy and there's like it kind of it draws you in and then it it just delivers so much more than you anticipate so you've done such a fantastic job with that we are getting to the stage in the book and what happened in book five with butcher's masquerade is that some of these characters that we're getting to know a little bit more um i mean everyone's fighting for their life and sometimes their life is snuffed out and Miriam Dom was uh, one that we lost in book five. Spoilers if you haven't read this. Oh, my gosh, I can't stress that enough. Um, the book is in the corner if you don't know that that was what we're talking about. Um, what I found devastating with this is that Miriam Dom was one of the few characters that had held on to compassion. And that was a crucial thing for her. Uh, and any information that you sort of reveal, she was a vegan for like, what, 19, 20 years and it's this whole thing where it's like, cool, let's use it against her. And she's become yeah. a vampire where she has to, you know, use blood to survive. Um, and those final moments where you think it could be a nefarious trap and it's not. Like Miriam Dom goes out with compassion at the same time and trying to minimise damage and make sure that Prepotente is going to be set up. What was that like for you? What was that like to start going, all right, here are all my characters, this is all the pieces on the board, I'm going to have to start taking some of them off. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be tough. I, I, I think I've said this before, when I write scenes, I don't necessarily know if the person's going to survive the scene or not. And I'll write it, and I'll write both versions of it, and then I'll pick the one that makes the most sense to the story and is the most interesting, the most entertaining. And... I just didn't see her surviving that. And, mm. and it, it's tough because she's one of the few left that was so, like you said, compassionate. There's very few of that left in the story. And I don't want to keep picking off all the good ones so much. So <laughs> <laughs> where's the balance? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And cause this story in particular, it kind of ends on an up note, but it, the epilogue is kind of on a down note. Whereas the, the next one kind of ends on kind of a down note, but the not so much. But it's, it's it feels like it's a down note. But then at the very very end, we kind of have an up and then another up in the epilogue, and so I want to balance up and down, up and down. But there are going to be more player deaths, and there's going to be some pretty awful ones. So that's just the way things happen in real life, and it's the way things happen in the dungeon. And how do I deal with it? It's it can be tough. It can make me laugh because I know people are going to be mad at me. <laughs> what are they mad at? What, is, what are the things that you've gotten? Oh, I, I get threatened all the time. Like, if you do anything to Mongo, I'm going to, you know, right. just, I'm Mongo just going to quit the yourself. book. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to stop saying this stuff on streams. <laughs> That's one of my favorite that I've made up. Uh, oh, yeah, there's in the chat, everyone's like, if X dies, we riot. Well, there's yes. going to be riots across the, the globe, it looks like. Uh, Lisa says, Bush's, Bush's Masquerade definitely got me crying the most in the series so far. Uh, if Mongo goes, we riot. Yeah, Mongo would be appalled um, over that. So there you go. <laughs> um, is there any other ones that people just like just sat poorly with the people surprisingly? Well, are they the question is are they ones that people want to keep alive it's more like you know was it a decision that was made that you made that was very necessary but it kind of like upset oh, people okay. in a way that was surprising and you're like wow really that thing yeah well a lot of it i enjoy the art of surprising myself uh a lot and the whole sequence at the end of the butcher's masquerade i wasn't expecting it necessarily to go that way I wasn't expecting Signet, for example, mm. to end that way. And it kind of makes sense, you know, what she does at the end. She basically sacrifices herself in order to make all of her tattoos alive. And that was not, it seems like the most obvious choice when you look at from the beginning, the beginning of her arc and how it ends. And but that wasn't in my head until I wrote mm. the scene. It just... Mm. It happens a lot. You know, you have all these puzzle pieces and then there's one piece left and then it just kind of fits in on its own. And that's, again, it's the joy of storytelling, being a discovery writer, finding out like 
well, this is how it sh would have gone if I wasn't really at the controls, and this is how I'm going to make it go because it's, you know, kind of the most beautiful way for it to happen, even if it's tragic. Mm. Yeah, you can't force things just to kind of placate, I suppose. Yeah, so mm. please don't riot when I kill Mongo. When? You said when, <laughs> not if. You said when, <laughs> not if. That was a joke. Well, okay. But well, I've just become the person that we were talking about, apparently. <laughs> God damn it, I did not pass the test. <laughs> All right. Uh, who are you most attached to as a character? You've said uh, over the years that Samantha's your favorite character. Who are you most attached Samantha's to? Samantha's my favorite character. She's still my favorite character. Your She's mother. still in book seven. Uh, you know, besides the core group, which is Carl and Donut, and then the secondary core group, which is like Mongo and Amani and Katya, of course, and Ellie and um, even Louie. I all that entire group. I, I'm fond of all of them. I really like Louie's character. I really like Ellie's character. I really like Amani's character. Mm. And you know, if anything were to happen, to any of and Katya's, of course, and if anything were to happen to any of them, I would be upset. But you know, again, this is. So a realistic story in so many ways. I mean, I, you know, they just need to get the the tenth floor, and this book book seven is the ninth floor. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. Uh, when you first started out, you thought that there would be like maybe nine, ten books. Is that the same? Nine to ten books. Yeah, I think it's going to be about ten books. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. Jeff Hayes has done such an amazing job bringing these characters to life. Um, I read on a Reddit AMA that when you first wrote the AI, it w you heard Samuel L. Jackson. How much has Jeff Hayes influenced these characters by bringing them to life in a way that was oh. a, different from how you initially envisioned it, but he's kind of like swept you up <laughs> in his take? You know, he's, as much as I hate to admit it, he's always right. When it comes to the voices... <laughs> he he reads he's so smart because he'll read the book and he'll get it and that's that's really important he understands what's happening what's happening on the page and what's happening behind the words and as a result of that when he makes these voices because he has so many voices as you know he does it almost perfectly every time and as a result of that when i'm writing the next book i hear those voices in my head as i'm typing the words and it's it's infuriating <laughs> because i i'm typing donut rants and i can hear like him <laughs> shrieking. <laughs> and you're like, this is my character. <laughs> exactly. He does such you know, a good job, though. And I, I've joked about this before, but if he, like, you know, does a voice I don't like, I just kill the character in the next <laughs> book. <laughs> no pressure, Jeff. <laughs> Do a good job. Oh, that's really funny. Um, I've never asked you this, but should you have gone into the dungeon, how would you have built you as a character? Where would you have placed your stat points? How would you, what would your build look like? And who's doing it the best in the book? That makes sense to you. I wouldn't have gone in the dungeon because I'm not an idiot. But uh, I, and if I had to have gone in like Carl, he had no choice. He would have died. I would have probably done some sort of dexterity build. Personally, okay. something where with a lot of dodging and a lot of protection spells. I would have been someone that, I'm like the type of play person to play Skyrim. I'm like the sneaky archer, just like everybody else is, honestly. But no, I'm not. I'm the opposite. I'm anything but that. We could team up actually, and we have good balance. There you go. Great. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because I don't know if I would. There is a character in there that you actually gave um, Max Dex stat to. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like there's um th those guys. Uh, we 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 haven't really met them. It's so much uh i think the person that's playing the game the best you haven't really revealed that she's been doing it but i think in book seven it's pretty clear say the name lena yeah yeah um okay oh how so you would go dex you wouldn't want her to get hit you do protection so you are basically conflict avoidant yeah i mean if you've ever been punched in the face you know it's no fun and something people want to avoid i would think especially when things that happen in that game you do feel yes. so even if it's like you know you're a tank you feel every one of those punches anyway okay that's a really yeah, good point absolutely okay um i have a theory as well which i would like to share with you uh florian okay. florian is an australian in here um the mm -hmm. time 
of the collapse where Carl was, was about 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. Australia would be running around seven hours behind but a day ahead, so 17 hours ahead, which means that in Australia it would have been sort of like 5 to 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening. Where are all my Aussies in the book? Because they'd be outside. There would be so many people outside, especially because it's winter in um, the Northern Hemisphere. So it would be a really beautiful, balmy summer evening where a lot of Australians would be outside. Now we have one. Are we going? And that one wasn't in Australia. He was in Africa. He was time. in Africa. So where, where are, where's my Southern Hemisphere rep? Is are they in? Because there's still tens of thousands in there. So I explained what happened very, very briefly in book one, and we've never really touched on it. Maybe I will later. And but it was the people in New Zealand, not Australia, New Zealand. That sounds about right. All get killed uh, because of. <laughs> Something gets some something goes wrong. One of the bombs oh, it was a glitch. becomes. I remember that it was. Yeah. A, it was like oopsie. Oh, sorry to everyone who was in New Zealand. Our bad. That's three million and lives right there. That's that's one of the side ideas I have. I have millions of little ideas that I'm going to eventually touch for, but we haven't really seen very many people from that area at all. Um, the closest is basically the Philippines, honestly, and. Maybe I'll touch on it. Maybe I won't. But I, I have been having this in my head, which is one of the reasons why I haven't shown too many Australian characters. Okay. All this to say, doing an Australian impersonation is usually quite hard. Jeff does a very good job. Should you need an Australian female voice in an upcoming book, there's bound to be in it. Just, I'm just putting it out there. Even though Jeff could probably do my voice better than me somehow but just we're just looking at logistics here i'm just waiting for the uprising of the australians who are just going to come here and be like right <laughs> we're gonna fuck shit up well, <laughs> well if anything we have the the sambu theaters version their their full cast versions which is fantastic they've the immersion tunnel it's called and i believe the first episode's free if you want to check it out too and it's really cool we have um uh, he who F- fights with monster narrator um, doing a couple voices in the first book, and he's going to do some more in the second one. Heath Heath Miller, and then um, I I don't know if there's any other Australians involved, but because there's only a couple characters with Australian accents, there's not many. There's Florin. There's the Ripper Wonton, who's a Quaka. Uh, Thank you. I don't know if I have any female Australian characters, but maybe I'll throw one in just just for you, Maude. Thank you. That's I, that would just be really, really sweet. I do appreciate. How many people in your life are like name a character after me or do this and put this in there because you do pants so much and you're like, there's every chance that it could be mentioned or referenced. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if you saw on the Discord there was, I mean, Discord the um, Kickstarter there was die in the next book and live in the next book. Mm-hmm. Were, were kind of the choices and there were supposed to be three of each and it happened so fast that we ended up selling like i think 11 of one and like six of the other but people wanting to die more well there's only supposed to be three of each like yeah. in the kickstarter and it glitched or something i don't even know what happened oh. but it, we sold like 12 people die in the dungeon or <laughs> live in the dungeon and like six or seven of people Okay, so we're you just going to add some new characters. Sure. Yeah, so that's what I've been dealing with this past week. So That's fun. <laughs> Get those creative juices flowing. <laughs> exactly. Well, that is all the time that we have. I do have more questions, but uh, we'll do this again. If you keep writing them, we'll keep reading them. Um, if you missed the announcement, Absolutely. let's go over it again. Uh, exclamation mark DCC. You can get a pre-order link. Book. Seven, the inevitable ruin. It's book seven in the dungeon. This called. inevitable ruin. This, sorry, this inevitable ruin. This one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be available November eleven. Now, if you've missed it, Matt hasn't finished it yet, but it's coming out November eleven. <laughs> one month countdown is on. You can it's pre-order it right now. It's almost done. It's almost done. If you're on the Patreon, you can check out up to chapter seventy-four. Um, I do recommend it. I think I still have the link uh, if you do want to sign up 
for that one. Everyone's doing glurp glurps, which is a lot of fun. Um, we'll make sure that we've got the link uh, to your Patreon to support you that way as well. Uh, keep your eye out on Amazon because the audiobook pre-link will come up so you can pre-order that one and that will be out in around February as well. But we're going to get book seven in a month. That is so cool. Are you pumped or are you just so tired? <laughs> I am terrified. You're like, let's let's go. We got this. I got to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm going to be writing till 4 a.m. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to chat with us, not only about the Butcher's Masquerade, but to announce the fact that the pre-order link is out for book number seven, which is so exciting. Uh, thank you so much, chat, for being so amazing. The glurps are glurping the whole way through here. Um, I really appreciate it. If anyone, if, 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 is there any other sort of promotion that we can tap into as we wrap things up? Go to your Patreon. Go to my Patreon. Uh, if you ordered on my Kickstarter, that'll be shipping soon. As um, soon as that's done and I made sure everyone gets the Kickstarter, we are going to be doing books two and three of Kickstarter. In addition to that, um, books four, five, and six hardcover will be coming out in just a couple of days. This Ooh. this very pretty thick book will hit on October 22nd in bookstores. I see and a mongo. There is a mongo and donut. I made them turn her around so she's facing the, the tree. Show me. Good, that so if you look cool. at the cover. Yeah. Oh, she's facing the train. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And that's going to be out October 22nd? I believe so. Whatever that Tuesday is. Great. There you go. Yeah. So if you're a fan, buy them all. We love that one. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. I'll let you go. Good luck with the next month. You're going to need it, okay? Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Bye. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sticking around and watching this one. Um, so much fun to chat with Matt. He's always so amazing. He's doing so much work right now as well. Uh, always check out his social media because he's at a lot of conventions. A lot of people in the chat saying that you got to meet him as well, which is really cool. And find out if he's been signing books too. That's a lot of fun with a scavenger hunt. Um, on that note, if you haven't joined Maud's book club and you want to, the book that we're doing for October is Nosferatu, which is a book by Joe Hill, who's Stephen King's son. We're going to be tackling that one in two parts over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've already announced our books for November and December as well. November, we're going to be doing TJ Clune's follow-up to House on the Cerulean Sea, uh, which was so wonderful. We did that last year and I got to interview TJ for that one as well. But Somewhere Beyond the Sea came out last month. We'll be doing that next month. The bonus book is going to be The Last Unicorn, which I've been hearing so many things about. There's not many standalones, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And then in December, Lightbringer. We are wrapping up uh, all the books that are currently out in the Red Rising series. And as always, I'll be getting Pierce Brown on to chat about each of these books as well. If that's your jam, follow us on Discord and social medias. We're putting out content all the time. You'll see fun clips from this go up as well. Matt, I'll send them to you if you want. <laughs> You can have those. Um, and uh, we, we join us on Discord. That's where you can find the majority of the information. Thanks to all the members who have signed up to the Patreon as well. We try to provide amazing perks for everyone, including uh, hanging out in a video call during our book club discussions as well. If that tickles your fancy, you can check out the Patreon link as well. But thank you so much for joining me. This has been a blast of an hour. Make sure you have a great day. And um, Mongo's not appalled right now, so that's something. But glurp, glurp, motherfuckers. <laughs> Bye.